point. So it's coming up to the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, we're going to have to read the Advent Collect, aren't we? Because it's just the best collect in the world. Maybe we'll do that. We'll do that at the end of, of the episode. First, first Sunday of Advent. So I thought we'd have an apocalyptic reading because Advent, you know, everyone always thinks oh, Advent is just about the birth of Christ. It's not just about the birth of Christ. It's also about the second coming of Christ as well. So it's about the final things as well as, you know, as as, as the anticipation of Christmas, you know, death, judgment, uh, the end of the world, heaven and hell and all that kind of stuff. So we selected the read- readings, actually. And, yeah. and, and I, I've had people um, over the years get, some people get quite upset by that. They come to an Advent service thinking they're coming to a carol service. Yeah. And it's all going to be, you know, Victorian hymns and car- um, uh, and mince pies. And <laughs> they get death, judgment, you know, yeah, hell and heaven. Uh, and it's real roller coaster stuff. And you try to say, oh, you know, kind of enter into a bit. It's, it's, it's really yeah. what's being put over is um, it's so compelling. And the, you know, it's the really, fascinating parts of the scripture i mean I, I had one family years ago walked out because they said it wasn't christmasy enough oh uh, well it's not christmas is it that's the but that's the big mistake everyone makes so oh, it's christmas it's not christmas until christmas yeah. eve all right it's not christmas it's advent get it right mm-hmm. the best ad well i don't say the best advent here but a lovely advent hymn which i i really adore is um though he comes with clouds descending with charles mm-hmm. wesley because that's not it's not at all about the first coming it's about the second coming and it's yeah. uh you know lo he comes with clouds descending once for mortal sinners slain and it talks about the kind of fear and awe that comes upon people as christ returns from heaven we, we do a service in one of our churches every year um to at the end of um christ the king to to mark our pre- preparation for advent which is sort of though it's those kind of hymns and readings and it and I, I forgot last Sunday just how powerfully it ends. We end very abruptly with the parable of the um, uh, the the wise virgins. Oh yeah, 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 foolish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whose correct. lamps were not lit. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, listen, that was it. It just ended with that, and I, yeah. uh, I, and one hymn, and I just thought this is, and we did it in complete darkness with candles, about 30, 40 of us. Very nice. And it, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Well, I have not selected that scripture, but I selected a scripture that comes before the scripture uh, for this Sunday, because I've been I've been reading the whole the whole chapter of Mark chapter 13. And I thought it'd be interesting to read about the abomination of desolation, so-called oh. uh, from verse 14 to 23 in chapter 13 of the, the uh, book of Mark. Um, Daniel, um would you mind saying the Lord's Prayer and reading the scripture reading? It's just that uh, my cold is causing me to um, be not uh, very good. Of course. Um, yeah. So yeah. Let, let's begin then with prayer. Mindful that we're privileged to call God Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we have um, chapter 13 from St. Mark, which is Mark's a much shorter gospel than the others. So it's sort of two thirds into into the text. Am I reading the whole 13? Um, uh, so from verse 14 to 23, please. Yes. Okay. Jesus said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short these days, no one would survive. But the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. 
For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. That's great, Daniel. Let's 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 stop it there. That's that's really, really good. Um, There in verse 26, 27, you've got Christ um, referring to himself as the Son of Man and making allusion to Daniel 7, which he does actually quite, quite frequently. it's amazing. It's an amazing uh, illusion, really. If people are interested. They should go and look up Daniel seven and read it through if they're not familiar with it. But yeah, the thing I was the thing I was really interested in in my my studying of this this scripture is is this particular passage on the abomination of desolation. And it seems to me, I'm not suggesting you know I'm an expert in this this kind of literature or anything like that. But it seems to me that this is really speaking about uh, the Antichrist, the appearance of the Antichrist at the end of history. And essentially, I think what Christ is saying here is um, in the whole context of this chapter is that things may get really bad. In fact, he's sort of at the same time as talking about the end of history. He also appears to be talking about the destruction of the temple. And I think what he's saying is kind of like things may get really bad. But essentially, when the end comes, when the very end of history comes, there will be no ambiguity whatsoever about it. There will be no mistaking it whatsoever. So that those verses there, verse 24, 27. You know, the sun will be dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of Man will coming in the clouds with, um, sorry, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather his elect, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be no mistaking that, be a completely unambiguous event. Everyone will know exactly what's going on. Before that happens, um, verse 21, having described these, you know, these sort of cataclysmic events, then if anyone says to you, so this is prior to the return of Christ, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or look, there he is, do not believe it. And that's that's why, well, that's a big sort of um, sign that this is talking about the Antichrist, because that is the nature of the Antichrist to masquerade as the Christ. And the Antichrist, it seems, it seems, I think, quite, quite likely, given what scripture says. And also we'll talk about things which are relevant to this later in the episode. But when the Antichrist appears, he will lead the nations astray and people will be saying essentially, you know, this is the Christ. This is the one who has come to save us. So they'll say, look, here is the Christ. Look, there he is. And there'll be pressure on believers to accept this, even though we know that when Jesus comes, it will be completely unambiguous and there'll be no debate mm. about it. There'll be there'll be there'll be false Christ who offer themselves as as the real Christ. And there'll be pressure. There'll be social and political pressure to to believe it and to go along with it so in verse 22 for false christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders so we'll talk about this later won't we daddy with the roger Ayer article we're going to talk about um perform signs and wonders to lead astray if possible the elect so even to try and lead astray christians and people who are committed you know devoted followers of jesus christ and then verse 23 of course you know the whole point of this whole thing but be on guard. I've told you all these things beforehand. So don't be fooled when these things happen. And this is kind of a really important thing, isn't it? Because it's really easy to skip over a chapter like chapter 13 of the Gospel of Mark and say, oh, this is all this crazy apocalyptic literature. You know, let's let's get into stuff that we understand. But Christ says this stuff for a reason, because at some stage it's going to happen. And in some ways it happens all the way throughout history. Mm-hmm. You know, he tells us this for a reason. Uh, I've told you all these things beforehand. I told you about this. So you've got to listen. So you've got to be on guard. So anyway, I just thought it's a, it's a really, really interesting passage of scripture. It, I, I suppose we'll, we'll, we'll get a bit of this at Christmas and we'll, we'll get it other parts of the year where the um, the caricature of Christ uh, is is simply meek and mild. You yeah. know, guy with long hair and sandals who said nice things uh, and um, got into trouble with the religious authorities and so on. Um, And we forget that he talks very strongly into the apocalyptic tradition. He's an apocalyptic prophet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he is the Christ, but he he is also the prophet. 
yeah. in that respect. Uh, and I find it intriguing how so much of mainstream Christianity, um, uh, you know, over the last few generations has been very coy about this yeah. uh, and struggled to do this or gone for, as we know, for another apocalypse. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll in, yeah, we we yeah we believe in in that things are getting worse, but that's just a you know that's simply a climate thing, or it's mm. uh, uh, or it's to do with um, uh, wars or whatever. But you know, it's uh, uh, we take we sort of devalue of it of its religious vocabulary, and yeah. uh, it's a secularized uh, form of it. Yeah, you know, and I think in this established church, we we where we're clearly in the danger of of doing that a lot of the time if you think a lot of the church of england's messaging on its website uh and its official output rarely touches upon this in any kind of serious depth i mean i i have to say one of the the theologians that i've come to admire over the last um 20 30 years is joseph ratzinger uh, mm. in that i think he he got a very interesting take on uh, on this and um, the direction of travel that history is moving in, and he he could speak about it in a way that um, uh, that, that that wasn't like some of the sort of loonies in the Bible Belt, you know, mm. who, who really go off on um, uh, on this on this subject. Um, uh, it, it's it's. I, I think you can't you 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 can't edit this out in the mm. life of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Uh, each of the gospels um, has this. Yeah, as uh, uh, as sort of concluding teaching material. You know, even the fourth yeah. gospel has elements of this, doesn't it? In the yeah. great discourses at at the last at the last supper. Um, but but too often, I think we're very shy of this. And I think it's a real shame that just as we've um, uh, disenchanted the world uh, in the last few centuries, uh, so likewise we've disenchanted our sense of time and history. Yeah. So uh, so Daniel, uh, can can I ask you then, what's the link between being an established church and being shy of apocalyptic literature? Is it because apocalyptic literature is kind of telling us something about you know, the world to come as opposed to this world? Or what do you think about that? Well, you know, you could say Christ was speaking to an established religion in, in his time. Yeah. But, um, you know, you can look at the some of the, the key players, like the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection, because uh, I, I think the, uh, the talk at the time was they weren't going to be resurrected. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't in the offer for the new heaven and the new earth. Um, so, are the Sadducees are they like the kind of uh, you know the the sort of sea of faith you know atheistic theologians and priests of the nineteen sixties yeah. and onwards? Who, who have lots of have lots of the levers of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, uh, so. They are religious to a degree, but they are very fawning over the Roman establishment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah um, it's interesting. Don't interesting. upset the balance. You know, keep the peace. Uh, uh, and, and and you can see how that that's that's one of the the shadow sides of an established church is yeah. that uh, if we if we are. It's only going to be in virtue signalling, as we can see, <laughs> that that will that will talk about the great eschaton in yeah. any shape or form, really. Um, but mostly, we'll airbrush it because that that's the the path of least resistance, isn't yeah. it? Or we'll imminentize uh, it so that it's about uh, you know, like we we you know having an NHS everywhere or you know whatever it might be, building a Jerusalem on this earth rather than it being brought about by Christ at the end of history after a sort of cataclysmic catastrophe, mm -hmm. which really is the sort of scriptural, scriptural. Yeah, or, um, or, or we'll, we'll, we'll sort of do this. Well, I think a, a lot of churches did this post the second world war, you know, God is calling us to build a new Jerusalem in Britain. Yeah. Um, 
and we can do this through social action and um uh, and yeah look that's not a bad thing but it's when it becomes a thing of vanity yeah uh, when we can't see that that as human beings if we try to create heaven by ourselves that's a doomed project yeah yeah it will only escalate into you know a a kind of existential flood tower of babel and all the other things that the good book tells us <laughs> uh the and the um, abomination of desolation being given the free reign to to come in when yeah. things start falling apart yeah, you know, yeah systems get more complicated as we get more invested in the vanity yeah um, yeah uh, yeah. As the scaffolding gets higher and higher, and the sort of history becomes more like a Jenga tower, you know, huh. it's more and more wobbly. And and so we're very prone, I think, then to someone coming in and say, "Oh, you know, I can hold this together." Yeah, and every and and somebody presents huh. himself with, as a solution to the problem, as a kind of ultimate and final solution. Yeah, uh, and that 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 is the as it were the, the spirit of Antichrist, if not the the actual Antichrist. Yeah.